Sandra opened her eyes. Last day, she thought, as she focused on the stripes and dots of early morning sun shimmering on the wall. She sat up and glanced at her daughter in the other narrow bed. Even at 11 years old, Emily still slept with her thin arms wrapped around a stuffed animal. A bearish dog or a doggish bear, they'd never been sure, and now the years had made it even more lumpy and unidentifiable. Rubbing the soreness from her neck and back, Sandra felt a bit lumpy herself. The beds were more like real beds this trip. Five inches of foam on a wooden platform rather than tatami mats on the floor. But her long, bony frame still protested. Three days of lugging oxygen tanks hadn't helped. 35 wasn't as forgiving as 25 had been back when she first began diving. Of course, back then she'd also had her ex-husband Bill to help her. Not that she really needed help then or now. She was strong, and she took a certain pleasure in hauling her own load. Uh, not so sure my back agrees with that decision anymore. She pulled back the unfinished fabric strips that served as curtains in this tiny house-turned hotel and slid open the window, breathing in the sea air. She reveled in the translucent quality of the sky, a soft echoing of the gray-blue water. She called it island light when she tried to explain it to her other teacher friends why she loved this tiny rock off the coast of Taiwan. But there's nothing there, they always said as they scraped together funds and made their plans to invade Thailand or Bali at the next holiday. It was true, Green Island was not luxurious in a vacation spot kind of way. It was not the lush rainforest green of Pacific Islands further south, but rather a cooler shade of forest interrupted by reddish-brown outcroppings, the craggy evidence of ancient lava flows. The aboriginal tribe had called it Fireburned Island, perhaps because of these rocky interruptions like scorch marks across the earth. Her Taiwanese friends, they referred to it as that place with the prisons and said it held the ghost of Chiang Kai-shek's political enemies from the last century. It had no large, pricey Hiltons or Hyatts, no spas, unless you counted a natural saltwater hot spring, one of only three in the world, Sandra told her friends. The beaches were tiny, rocky strips with signs posted to warn that dynamite fishing was illegal. Feral goats munched grass along roadsides, with only an occasional motorbike puttering by. But surrounding the island, one of the last truly ancient coral reefs in the world. She needed coffee but stayed where she was, leaning on the windowsill, watching the daily ritual at the house across the road. A squatty, sun-brown Taiwanese man climbed a ladder from the roof of his squatty cement home to the wooden two-story pigeon loft attached haphazardly on stilts above him. He wore a sweat-stained, sleeveless undershirt, khaki shorts, and flip-flops. She'd seen this uniform a thousand times throughout Taiwan, on cellars and market stalls, on road crews napping in the cabs of blue work trucks, on the men that delivered and unpacked her moving boxes a year ago. The pigeon man disappeared through some hatch or other into the loft. Wooden panels began opening, each releasing a pigeon to the air. The flock wheeled and turned in the morning sun, first out to sea, then sweeping inland over the hotel, and then out of view. The pigeon man made his way to the second story, opened more panels, and now stood on a tiny porch watching his birds. They would be back, circling, invisibly tethered to him somehow. Sandra had asked Charlie about the pigeons yesterday on the boat while they rested between dives. Were they for food? Her scuba guide had cracked a smile. I think they're for gambling, he had said between chopstick bites of fried noodles from his tiny box lunch. What about the little deer tied up in some of the yards? Are they also for gambling? Charlie let out a laugh through a mouthful. They are for barbecuing. She had laughed with him, enjoying the camaraderie that had grown between them after a few of these island trips. Charlie Liu organized excursions around Asia for his Taipei diving friends, mostly expatriate Americans and Europeans, but the quick trips to Green Island were his favorites. He said it was like home down here for him. He was probably Sandra's age, maybe a year or two younger, though she found it hard to pinpoint the ages of her Taiwanese friends, their faces not yet showing the tiny lines around the eyes that she'd begun noticing on her own. Emily stirred slightly in her sleep. Sandra knew what the last day meant for Emily. It meant Sandra had to give a decision about Hawaii, the source of several fights in the week leading up to Green Island. 
Sandra thought about Bill's email again and clenched her teeth. Mary from my office is returning from there on business and has agreed to make her connecting flight through Hawaii so if she could accompany her. Em would need to fly back by herself. I talked to the airline. They will put her with an airline rep the entire time until she's handed off to you. Sandra had progressed from clenching her teeth to grinding them. Nice choice of words, handed off like a package. Bill's confidence, no, his arrogance that he could just work things out the way he wanted as usual, change all their carefully mapped out plans for the summer, just as he had done at Christmas break, plus thinking Emily was old enough to travel alone. The man had no regard for anyone but himself. Emily was too young, too impulsive to fly alone. Stop it, Sandra, not worth it, she muttered to herself, as she had for days, each time these thoughts began pestering her. Just as pestering was Emily, pushing for a decision and picking small fights with Sandra since the moment she had first bounced into her mother's bedroom to say, Dad wants me to come to Hawaii for two weeks. They'll have the baby with them, and there's a condo on the beach, and Mom, can I go, please? He said he's sending you details. And what were they thinking, going to Hawaii with a baby anyway? Or two babies, Bill's new wife looked like a kid. Ridiculous. Sandra pushed it out of her mind. They had agreed to table the discussion until after Green Island. The pigeons were beginning to return to their loft, landing on the peak of the roof and the railing of the balcony before fluttering inside. She would ask Charlie what made the birds come back. She reached for an elastic band left on the windowsill the night before and began methodically wrangling her frizzing hair into a blonde topknot as Emily opened her eyes and brushed long strands from her own face. The humidity only managed to make her daughter's waves more lovely. Bill's hair, one of the man's redeeming qualities. Emily had also inherited his thick-lashed, twinkly blue eyes. On Bill, those eyes had been oceans where women lost themselves, and as she was to find out a few years into their marriage, were still losing themselves. On Emily, they were simply full of mischief and fun, except when she was very tired. The girl looked over to see her mother watching and grinned. If the eyes and hair were Bill's, the grin was all Sandra wide and toothy, a bit too big for her face, and something that lit up Sandra's world. Always open, Sandra sang. 7-Eleven, Emily completed the high-pitched sing-song jingle in a voice still full of sleep. She yawned, sat up, and suddenly lost all her sleepiness in a way that always amazed Sandra. Breakfast time. Down the stairs and across the road, they entered the American store that had conquered Taiwan. 4,000 stores strong if Wikipedia was to be believed. The one next to their Taipei apartment had become a sort of haven for them over the last year. They'd made many a meal of 7-Eleven items, dried fruit, eggs, bread, city cafe coffee for Sandra, yogurt drinks for Emily, Coke Slurpees all around. It was where they played pick a random package, guessing its contents by the picture, then sampling pastries filled with red bean paste or dipping into cocktail nuts with tiny dried fish in the mix. It was where they paid utility bills, scanning at the register like a pack of gum, and loaded money on their bus passes. This one on Green Island was a ritual comfort, though the eggs boiling in a vat of tea gave the place a musty sulfur smell in the mornings. Otherwise, they would be having the morning ration of soupy rice porridge, pork floss, and pickled vegetables that Charlie apparently loved. Charlie? He was standing at the counter buying a cup of coffee. There was something wrong with the coffee pot at the hotel, so I thought I'd join you, he said. Charlie! Emily ran up to him, and they bumped knuckles, letting their hands swim back like jellyfish. It was their private greeting. Help me pick out something for breakfast, he asked the girl, and she led him to the refrigerator case. Sandra made a cup of coffee from the self-serve machine and let herself think about last night. The German couple diving with them, Charlie's former students, had decided to visit the hot spring, so she, Emily, and Charlie had shared a meal, at a meal at a wobbly wooden table, one of the only three tables at one of only three restaurants on the island. Modeled after some American honky-tonk, the place was called the Two-Step, except the W and O were reversed, so the neon bulbs blinked out Toe-Step instead. After dinner, Emily went off with a stack of 10 NT coins to load up the jukebox. There were actually a couple of really old-school country tunes, the ones with hound dogs and broken-down trucks in the lyrics, mixed in with Taiwanese pop songs. And Sandra found herself answering a few questions about her life in the U.S. and asking Charlie more about his own life. He surprised her. He'd been surprising her since they first met in the fall. He was Taiwanese, but raised partly in California, 
surfing with his cousins and going to Mandarin classes on the weekends. He used to pretend that he'd stay in California forever, going back for visits to Taipei and bragging about how he surfed whenever he wanted and how he never had to go to cram school. But then we came back to Taiwan. My parents needed to care for my grandparents. It's what you do when you're Taiwanese. He'd finished high school in Taipei, he told her, with one foot in Taiwanese culture and one foot in American culture and no clear identity in either. His solace had been to slip away where he could surf on the north coast and take bets from his friends on the depth and dura duration he could free dive. It wasn't California, but he'd learned to love and respect the rocky coast with its rough, ever-changing conditions that would threaten to smash him against the reefs in the surge. He'd done his required two years with the Taiwanese military, learned to dive with scuba equipment, and been a frogman storming the beaches in endless drills. Spending that much time under the water, seeing the world down here on the reef, that became my place, he said. I didn't go back to California. I got my dive master cert and opened my business. And how is business? Sandra had asked, knowing full well that with his excellent English, he had a waiting list of expats from US, Canada, and Europe signed up for scuba classes. He knew she was teasing him a bit. Plenty of bored American tie ties to help pay the bills. This was a running joke between Charlie and all his diving friends who harassed him endlessly about the droves of expat housewives who seemed to end up on his client list. He suddenly looked at her a little bit more solemnly. You're different, though. Something in the way he looked at her made her want to blush. She felt a curl coming loose from the bun at the nape of her neck and began to fidget with it. Yes, with, you, you get, with me, you get a rusty diver on a budget and a kid to tag along on the boat, he grinned. And what do you get with me? Somebody that wants to come down here all the time to hang out with the goats and that gets excited about an octopus on a reef. The octopus was good today, Charlie, really good. I didn't even see him at first. She found herself leaning forward and starting to babble about boxfish and sea snails. Charlie was still grinning at her. Bill had never let her talk biology for more than a minute before changing the subject. She felt herself blushing again. I'm sorry, I get a little carried away. Mom! Emily's voice broke through her musings and brought her squarely back to 7-Eleven. She must have been trying to get her attention for a while. Charlie was standing in the aisle, holding up a sampling of yogurt drinks. Do you want anything to eat? Yes, of course, sorry. The strawberry is fine. Why did I say that? I don't even like strawberry. Emily gave her a wide-eyed stare and then turned to watch Charlie hand over the smoothie and a straw with a smile. The girl giggled, rolled her eyes, and plopped down beside her mom. An hour later, they loaded their gear and themselves on the dive boat and began reviewing the plans for the day's dive while the captain motored out to the first site. The German couple nodded and smiled in recognition as Charlie traced their route on a hand-drawn map of the reefs. He was anxious to get underway, pointing out some clouds in the distance, so once everyone had checked gear, they made their way to the back of the boat. Sandra made a last check with Emily, who was busy taking pictures. We'll be down for about 45 minutes to an hour. You know to listen to Captain and Mrs. Gow and make sure you've got your stuff ready this time so we could snorkel during the break. Sandra always had a rush of mom nerves before she went in the water. They never had a problem, but Emily always looked younger and smaller to her just before she made a dive. Do you think this will be the only dive? Charlie said there's some bad weather letter. You know what that means, Mom. Not now, Emily. I need to make sure you're paying attention. You need, she started to go through her list of instructions, but Emily broke in. Hawaii, Mom, you promised. Her daughter was laughing as she said it, but still it rankled. I said, not now. Emily stopped smiling. Fine. You don't have to say it. I'll be careful, and I won't fall in, and I won't drop the camera overboard. Sandra hadn't even thought about that last one. Emily was getting too good at sounding just like her. She started to say something to let Emily know that she hadn't meant to, meant to snap, but Charlie tapped her on the shoulder. Sandra, your turn. She checked the air valve one last time, and then he let her go. She adjusted her mast, waved at her somewhat sulky daughter, and clamped her teeth down on the regulator. Next came the rush of water the splash and coolness as she rolled backwards from the boat and began descending. Usually they all bobbed at the surface first and then started a gradual descent, but here they risked being carried away from their starting point and having to swim against a surface current. Instead, they'd opted to do a negative buoyancy dive, emptying all the air from their BCDs so that they could immediately get below the surface. She relished the change from air world to water world, the slipping into another universe where blues and grays dominated where the heaviness of tanks and bulkiness of gear suddenly disappeared. There was no fighting to stay above, 
No thoughts of swim strokes or breaths quickly sucked at the surface. Only immersion and acceptance of this alternate world of cool, liquid life. She became aware of her breathing. It was fast, the adrenaline of the first dive of the day elevating her heart rate. She was descending a bit fast, too. She chuckled into her regulator as Charlie caught her eye and motioned for her to slow down and make sure the pressure in her ears and mass were equalized. There was a time when she'd always had the opposite problem, when she had to be overloaded with weights just to get down or even pulled downward by her dive guide when she simply couldn't overcome her own buoyancy. Now, though, she felt the familiarity of all the dives she'd done over the last decade, the comforting sound of her own breaths bubbling out, slower, more controlled now, and the awakening of her senses to life on the reef. Charlie signaled OK, pointing at her and making the classic sign of thumb and forefinger in a circle. She returned the sign with both hands, then spotted and signaled the German couple. They all hovered at 18 meters to get their bearings and find the two massive coral-covered rocks that stood like giants, guarding the entrance to the coral garden. This morning's would be the deepest dive, close to 30 meters. They followed a dive profile of deep to shallow each day to give their bodies time to eliminate the nitrogen. Charlie insisted on safety, something she respected, something Bill would have derided. They swam through an area of soft corals and anemones to rival a flower garden. Tropical fish like butterflies flitted in and out of fan and staghorn corals. A tiny cloud fish burst from its host anemone and began a fierce assault on her bubble trail. Charlie snapped a picture. She could see his eyes crinkle and a smile behind his mask. She hovered above an area of sand, careful not to disturb it, watching a movement around a single tiny hole. A goby fish less than an inch long and a similarly sized shrimp had set up housekeeping sharing this tiny burrow. The goby stood guard at just outside, flicking its spike of a dorsal fin like a radio antenna, while the shrimp rolled a ball of sand, a boulder to him, out through their front door. She studied these symbiotic relationships and talked about them often with her students, encouraging them to look at how they work together in the classroom with their friends and with their families. She thought about her own little family. She shouldn't have snapped at Emily. The girl was just excited, and yes, she loved her dad. Still, though, the recent fighting was not as bad as it could have been. Certainly, it was not like the year that Bill had moved out of their suburban home. Sandra's bottomless anger, exhausting grief and shame, the ache of loneliness, all of it had threatened to suffocate her. She felt her own breathing speed up again and had to focus slow, slow, in, out, let it go. And then there had been the days of guilt and sorrow of knowing her daughter was suffering through this train wreck with her. She had found herself bribing, pleading, trotting out whatever dog and pony show she could come up with to make Emily behave, ever fearful of making things worse. Inevitably, though, Sandra would lose patience over incessant whining and temper tantrums and would launch into a strident tirade, storming through the house, banging doors, saying things that had no business being said. Those were the nights that Emily would fall asleep sobbing in Sandra's bed, while Sandra, devastated by her own tantrum, down a large glass of wine and pleaded with God for forgiveness and patience and above all just some kind of relief. That awful year for the first time since she began teaching, Sandra stayed home at spring break. There was nowhere she wanted to go, nowhere that would remind her of new sundresses and spa packages and Bill's famous margaritas after Emily was tucked into bed. Instead, she'd invited her mom out for a visit and promised Emily trips to the zoo and children's museum. A strong, gracious woman with a southern drawl, Donna arrived with one neatly packed suitcase for her coordinated outfits, a book for Emily, and the hair rollers and hairspray that tamed her graying hair, which tended toward Frizzy like Sandra's. Three days into the visit, Sandra came into the kitchen to find her mom vigorously stirring up sweet tea, her lips pressed into a thin, tight line. What is it, Mom? Do you need some help? I just need to come right out and say something. She heaped more sugar into the hot, swirling liquid, took a spoonful of tea, tasted it, and continued. What happened between you and Bill was bad, but Sandy, it's over. Please, she looked Sandra squarely in the eyes, stop letting it be an excuse for Emily's bad behavior. Otherwise, he will have spoiled something infinitely more good than that marriage ever was. Donna held up a hand, her pale blue eyes flashing a warning. Neither mom nor daughter was known for backing down from a good argument, but Sandra bit her tongue. You are a great mom, Sandy, and you're a great teacher. I mean that with everything in me. You know how to do this, and you and Emily are going to be fine. Donna poured a glass of tea over ice and handed it to her daughter, then made one for herself, and it was clear she wasn't going to say any more on the subject. Things had changed after that, slowly but for good. 
Sandra had gone back to everything she knew about children and boundaries to help them both move from survival mode to something more normal. She began having weekly chats with a pastor, a woman who actually understood something about heartache and trying to move past the anger. And eventually, she and Emily found a new rhythm. They had come, then had come the Taiwan job, teaching seventh grade science at the international school, free tuition for Emily, and a chance to have some adventure. Miraculously, Bill hadn't blocked it, though he did seem though he did seem skilled at making Emily's vacation visits as complicated as possible for them. Sandra suspected he'd been glad to be rid of the every other week hassle of custody visits while he played house with his new, very pregnant wife. She heard a metallic rapping sound and turned to see Charlie tapping his tank with his knife to get her attention. A lithe sea snake, a crate, weaving through the water a few meters to their left. With tiny teeth, but a powerful neurotoxin, the non-aggressive snakes had been known to bite a careless hand groping along. If its teeth managed to sink into the flesh webbing between the fingers, it could inject enough venom to cause paralysis, perhaps death. Sandra watched it swim past, looking for all the world like its land-bound cousin, the eastern coral snake, which her grandfather had once shown her as it slithered through dead leaves. His words still had true. Don't reach your step where you can't see. That's why she swam with her fingers interlaced, letting her fins gently propel her, using her breathing and slight turns of her body to maneuver up, down, side to side. Now they approached the drop-off where the soft corals came to the edge of a precipice, a hard coral wall that descended well below her dive limit. Her dive limit. They made their way out past the precipice and began a leisurely downward cruise along the wall to their right, a vast apartment complex for fish, eels, and the occasional octopus. The blue water stretching out to their left seemed empty and alien compared to the reef, like the edge of the atmosphere before the darkness of space. They were coming to the end of the wall, to a place where the current picked up in strength. It was a spot where opposing currents flowed one on top of the other, not somewhere they wanted to swim. Charlie had told them they would circle back to a cut through in the reef when they got to this point in the dive. Then the thrum of a boat motor cut through her thoughts. The boat must be moving to the exit point. She checked her watch, saw they still had 20 or 30 minutes of bottom time left, and wondered why the captain was changing position. But now the motor sound stopped and a new sound intruded, a sharp clang, clang, clang of metal striking metal. There was a pause, then three sharp clangs again. She saw Charlie motioning for her to join and saw the German couple begin to swim over from where they were photographing a cuttlefish. The clanging sound seemed to grow sharper, more urgent, as Charlie pulled out his slate and wrote, boat signaling problem above will begin safe ascent. This could not be good. The only other time Sandra had heard that kind of clanging was years ago when a diver had run in, had had a run in with a moray eel and the boat captain had needed to get the entire group to surface quickly to take care of the man. I've got to get to Emily. Her worry must have registered in her eyes because Charlie underlined the word safe and pointed at her, then erased the slate and wrote, maybe weather. Clang, clang, clang still rang out at intervals. With no way to communicate, the captain wouldn't know if they were getting the message until they began to surface. Charlie pointed to his palm with two fingers, asking her to check her oxygen. More than half a tank, but she needed to slow her breathing or she would drain it quickly. She motioned with a thumbs up to request they begin ascent. Charlie pointed to his head, think. He wrote on the slate, five minutes swim back, five minutes safety stop. If they tried to ascend here, the current running opposite of the surface would pull them away from the boat. That's how divers became lost at sea. They needed to backtrack along the wall. Sandra signaled okay, even as another clang, clang, clang vibrated through the water. And that's when she saw it, a massive, solitary, oceanic gray shark. She shrunk inside herself, wishing she could hide in the reef. She'd seen sharks before, but never this close. It cruised past her like a battleship, never stopping, never looking at her, heading down to the end of the wall and then turning 90 degree degrees into the current. It hung there, completely unmoved by the rush of water. The shark's side was streaked with white. This was no it. This was a she. And Sandra knew the white scars were where the teeth of a male had held her during the mating season. But the season was over, and she was here, alone, exhausted, scarred with bite marks, and likely famished. But the shark didn't seem to be eating. She just hung there in the current. Something else was happening. Small fish darted out from the reef. They barreled headlong into the shark's sides and head, feasting on parasites. The creature opened her mouth to let them bump against her teeth for a moment before turning to face the deeper blue and swim away. Sandra felt a shockwave pass through her as something touched her arm. 
It was only Charlie, motioning her to begin inching back down the wall toward their new exit point. Emily. For a moment, she'd forgotten her daughter above. Now she prayed for things to be okay for ten more minutes, for it to just be the weather. What an idiot, leaving your kid up there while you dive. The clanging became fainter as they were moving away from the boat to a safer exit point. Charlie had slowed, waiting for her to catch up. He reached his hand out toward hers. At first she thought he was making a dive sign. Then she realized he was taking hold of her hand. They swam like this to a place where the reef made an indention like a cutaway view of a chimney running to the surface. Here they'd make a safety stop and brief, a brief wait at six meters to let their bodies shed nitrogen. It's not mandatory for my depth, thought Sandra. She knew she could make an emergency ascent, but Charlie still held her hand. With the other hand, he removed a fluorescent orange packet. He looked into her eyes stern, sternly, deeply. Stay. The word rose into her mind, a calm, strong voice. Not a command, but an invitation to relax and think and trust. He let go of her hand, attached the orange packet, and let it unfurl as it inflated into a long orange tube that would reach the surface. This sausage, as the divers called it, would let the boat pinpoint them. Charlie reached for her hand again, but she signaled okay. She would stay put for a few more minutes, occasionally adjusting her breathing to suspend herself where she was. Charlie grinned around his regulator and took her hand anyway. Whatever it is up there, they would know soon enough. But Bill will never let me off the hook if something has happened to Emily. She shook the thought away, as if this moment had anything to do with Bill. He's gone, not here. This is our life now, and I love it. Hawaii floated into her mind from the place where she kept stashing, stashing it. It was two weeks of her child's life, their good life here. That was all. It was a plane trip, probably no more dangerous than being on a dive boat in the Pacific. The clanging had been replaced by the boat motor getting closer. Sixty seconds. She saw Charlie looking into her eyes again, his own kind brown eyes magnified by the mask. She squeezed his hand, and at last they were swimming to the surface. Sandra broke through the water, still breathing through the regulator, trying to reorient herself in the surging sea. Charlie held her hand. He squeezed it once more and then let go to check on the German couple. Dark clouds had moved in, and the wind was whipping the waves into a frenzy. Water sloshed against her mask, but she could see Emily leaning over the side, waving her toward the ladder. She swam a few yards to the boat, feeling the sea fight against her. Something was wrong, not with Emily, but definitely wrong. Normally, the captain or his wife would be reaching down to take her weights and flippers so she could climb up, but she only saw Emily. Holding the bottom of the ladder but trying not to be bashed against it by the wave, she spit out her regulator to call up to Emily. Where's the cat? But she inhaled seawater, spluttered, stuck her regulator back in her mouth. Mom, hand up your flippers, Emily yelled, reaching down. Sandal struggled to hold, up, hold onto the ladder while she handed them up to her daughter. She started climbing up, feeling ridiculously heavy after the weightlessness of di diving. Emily stood, all 70 pounds of her, ready to give her a hand as she swung first one leg, then the other over the side of the boat. In an instant, Sandra knew what was wrong. The regulator dropped out of her mouth. Oh, good Lord! There laid out on the floor of the boat was the captain, with a huge bloodied bandage that looked suspiciously like Sandra's favorite T-shirt wrapped around his head. Beside him lay a massive, glassy-eyed grouper with a fishing spear in its side. Mein Gott! The German woman had just climbed out of the boat onto the boat as well. Within seconds, the two women shrugged off their gear and knelt down beside the captain. He opened his eyes and smiled weakly at them, then winced and closed his eyes again. Emily, what happened? asked Sandra. Hold on, Mom. Charlie and Herr Heinemann are coming up. Emily again took up her post beside the ladder to assist. Charlie pulled off his mouth. His mask took one look and mouthed, wow. She wasn't sure if the wow was about the fish or the bloodied captain, but before she could ask him, he turned back to make sure the other diver was safely on board. Charlie yelled toward the front where the wife, now turned captain, had been working to keep the boat in place. Charlie gave her an okay sign and pointed to the shore. Mrs. Gow nodded and pointed the boat toward home. Stow the gear, guys, so we can pick up some speed. It's getting ugly out here. Charlie knelt down beside the captain and exchanged a few words before heading forward to talk to Mrs. Gow. The wind whipped up white caps around them as this boat smacked against the waves. They weren't far from shore, but already the rain had reached them and a crackle of lightning streaked the sky. Sandra secured her tank so it wouldn't roll around and nearly lost her balance as the boat lurched. She sat down quickly and turned to see Emily sitting on the floor beside the captain, putting a rolled up beach towel under his head. He seemed to be sleeping, perhaps even unconscious. But when the fish started to slide away after the boat hit a bump, his eyes flew open, he grabbed the spear rope and held on. Emily looked up at Sandra and grinned. Her patient was obviously not too seriously hurt. 
Charlie carefully made his way toward her from the front of the boat. He squeezed Emily's shoulder as he passed the girl. Sandra felt her stomach flip-flop and not from the tossing waves. He sat on the bench beside her and leaned in so she could hear him over the roar of the motor. Gal was free-diving and trying his luck with a new spear gun. That beauty swam by and took him for a ride. He finally got it to the surface, but the storm kicked up faster than they thought and the waves scraped him against the reef. He was woozy, but adamant they'd get the fish out too. He said Emily wrapped up his head and helped his wife paw up their dinner. He paused and grinned at her. That was Emily banging on the side for us to come up. She's great, Sandra. Sandra nodded and shivered, her body temperature low after the dive. Charlie looked her over, pulled a beach towel from the storage locker under his seat and wrapped it around her shoulders. He started to pull the arm away, but Sandra leaned into him, resting against his strong, capable body, letting relief wash over her. Charlie, she said after a few minutes. He leaned closer to hear her over the roar of the engines. Why did the pigeons come back to the loft? What? He looked at her and laughed. She knew it was the last thing he expected her to ask, but she'd had enough of the ocean for one day. You know, the pigeons next door to us. I think it's because their mates and their nests are there. They like their families, I guess. She thought about this all the way into shore, happy to lean against Charlie, happy to hear Emily laugh with each bump as she sat beside Captain Gow and the grouper. Once docked and reassured that the captain and his fish were being well taken care of by Mrs. Gow, they scrambled to unload in the downpour. Emily strained to carry a tank half her size and turned to grin at her mom as she hoisted it by herself into the beat-up van. They climbed in, and Sandra motioned for Emily to sit down. I've decided, she said as she kissed her daughter's streaming hair. Emily looked up with twinkling eyes. Yes, can I go? Did Charlie help you decide? Sandra rolled her eyes and grinned. Yes, along with a massive shark and some pigeons and a wonderful girl on a boat. Yes, I've decided you can go. She held up a hand to preempt Emily's celebration. Just promise you'll be as smart as you were today, especially on that flight back home. She kissed her again, laughing at the squills of delight and the cascade of plans Emily was already making. Maybe it was time Sandra made some new plans of her own as well.